Hi folks, and hope you're still having a lovely day. And this month we'll be learning about roses at the Queen Mother Rose Garden and the Piper Alpha Rose Garden at Hazelhead, and a bit about soft wood cuttings. Today we're going to be talking about roses. And we're at Hazelhead Park, the new home of roses in Aberdeen. They have over 26,000 roses here and over 200 varieties. And luckily enough, we'll be showing some do's and don'ts about your roses at this time of year. From Charles Shan Gardner at Hazelhead Park, who's worked with the roses now every single day for the past seven years. Hi, Danny. Hi, Daniel. And I'll be taking over now to show you all about roses. No, it wasn't my twin or a handsome stunt double. It is me. Well, I could talk about roses all year, every single month. But this segment will be a one-off do's and don'ts at this time of year and what you should be looking for. Roses are regarded as one of the most beautiful plants in the world, and rightly so. They have a great flower. They can flower all season for six weeks. The problem with roses is there's a lot of things to learn about them and a lot of different ins and outs. And I'll try and break down to the foundations of little tips and top things to do to look after your rose today. Firstly, what I'm going to show is identifying the rose that you have. Many people go to garden centres and just pick a rose for the colour. That's all great because that's what you're buying the plant for. You want to have a great colour, scent or something like that. But what you need to know is what type of rose it is. This will help you further down the line identifying the problems you can have with it or the do's and the don'ts that you can do with it. In the, the, two plant, the two main varieties of roses, modern roses now, are either a hybrid tea or a floribunda. Hybrid teas have mainly three or four main stems. And off that three or four main stems, the hybrid tea usually grows the long stems to hold this big, beautiful flower. And hybrid teas are slightly bushy, but not as bushy as the floribunda. Floribunda rose. Floribunda meaning Latin for many flowers. Very similar to a hybrid tea, but the difference is there's a lot more stems, and on that stems are thinner, and they hold a lot more smaller buds, but more flowers. Hopefully that's helped you identify which type of rose you have. It's really important as some of the help I'm going to show you further down the line is specific to one type and not the other. One of the first things I'm going to talk about is fertilising a rose. What I hear all the time is I use tomato fertiliser on my roses, which is all great. Roses and tomatoes are very similar as one produces a massive bud and the other one produces fruit. But what I stress to people is that when you're beginning to look after a rose, use a general fertiliser. Not just to promote the flower, but to give the root strength and the stem strength. You need the root strong enough to pull in all the nutrients, to make the stem strong enough to hold the flower and to produce the energy up to the flower. So it's all great once your buds have shown to use your tomato feed, but I recommend early on to use a general fertilizer once or twice a week just to build up the rose so it's strong enough to actually produce the flower. Another thing we're going to talk about is mulching your rose bed. I strongly advise for you to mulch your rose beds, but to be done with organic material, either from your, your collection that you're doing yourself or from a recycling centre. Never use bark. When you put bark in a rose bed, the nitrogen rises to actually break down the bark before it goes down to feed the rose. So you're actually starving it. So always use organic material and never bark. And one of the biggest problems you'll have with roses is pests, and most typically aphids, green fly and white fly. Green fly are easy to spot. They colonize or group on the underside of buds, on their leaves or on the stem. And what they do is they eat away at the plant material weaken the rows, produce their young who then produce sooty mould and once they've done so, all of this it actually weakens the rows so much that it'll distort the leaves and make it prone to diseases coming in. When dealing with aphids there's many forms of attack to sort of prevent them from getting the best out of your roses. Obviously the most common is a chemical spray which is all fine you can get from your local garden centre or wherever but I try and use as much natural remedies as possible. And if I am using a chemical spray, I'll make sure the active ingredient is perithrum, which is derived from a natural plant itself. Another form, which is biological, which is another great idea, is ladybirds. Ladybird lava tend to eat all green fly. So if you find a ladybird in your garden, make sure to put it next to your roses, as they'll protect them more than you can probably. Another form, which is sort of an old story that I've heard, which is actually true if you use it in the correct methods, is fairy up liquids. But what I hear is people saying, ah, oh, I used the fairy up liquid and it didn't work. Well, the problem is if you've already got green fly or white fly in, they're already attached to the rose. So what you have to do is, is wash away the green fly, clean your entire rose, and then spray the fairy up liquid and do that every single day as the, the green fly will no longer be able to stick to the rose and attack your buds and other plant material. Another pest that you'll find you have to deal with with roses is thrips. Thrips very similar to aphids, 
but they're much, much smaller, so they're hard to see. And the only time you really know is when the damage has already been done. And thrips, they usually come in once you've got rid of your green fly. And you'll easily notice the damage they do by this distortion of leaves. They start to curl up because all the energy has been soaked out of them. That'll be the first sign, the distorted leaves. And then when your bud does come to flower, you'll also have curled and distorted flower as well. And this is where they've attacked the leaf inside the bud and they've soaked the energy out. And when your bud flower opens, it'll be distorted as it can't open fully because it's been drained down the edges. When dealing with thrips, it's much more difficult than aphids. One, because there is only one really chemical spray you can use, and it still is a pyrithrium derived from a plant, but it isn't as effective on thrips as it is on other uh, um, pests and diseases. And there's no biological for thrips. There is one other tail I have heard which does work, but it takes a lot of work to use to do it. And it's to make a garlic mixture. So boil garlics, make them into a liquid form, and then spray it on your rose. What this does is, the thrips can't smell the sweet scent of the buds and the foliage and they only smell the garlic which puts them off so they actually go somewhere else for it and then while if, if you spray the, the garlic spray and then your fairy up spray the thrips can no longer attach themselves so it's a two form attack knocking them off with of the scent and then so they can't actually attach themselves to the plant the garlic solution may work in your own garden if you're willing to give up the scent just to get rid of the pests. But in a garden this size at Hazel Head, it's not really great. There's a lot of people coming for the scent. I don't want to bother my friends Count Dracula and that who come in at night to see the roses. One of the other problems you can have with roses is dieback. The problem with dieback is the stem has died so far down but it's still alive. This can happen for many different reasons. It could be poor pruning, it could be frost, or it could be a nutrient deficiency but you will have to remove it because if you leave the dead wood on it could be attacked by other diseases such as nectaria where it attacks dead wood and it could spread to the living growth if you don't get rid of it. Another disease but unfortunately I don't have any examples to show you well not unfortunately it's quite good not to have it but it's powdery mildew it looks like talc on the bud and it isn't dangerous but it can stop the bud from flowering and I know it's horrible but the best thing to do for this is actually cut the bud away Remove all the debris, make sure the rose is well aerated, as it's a moisture issue it will cause this. If the plants are too much together, the wetness, dryness, it then creates the moisture and humidity that will create mildew. And the best thing to do for this is instantly remove it. I know it's horrible to take away a bud, but it actually protects the rest of the buds on the plant. Black spot, the most common disease known to roses. What it is, is a black spot essentially on your leaves. It's actually quite horrible, it's a fungal disease again. What happens is you'll start with little black spots emerging on your leaves and then eventually once it's discoloured them and distorted them, they all drop. So you're left just with a scaggy rose with just a bud at the end. And it just starts off with that black spot. Best method to attack this is to remove all the stems and damaged leaves and instantly remove them. Don't let them go about as it may have spores that are going to spread on. And what you'll look at it is something like this. It'll just turn to yellow and just drop away and it'll cover your whole rose doing that so you're left with no leaves left at all. Make sure your rose is well aerated so it gets air in to dry it so the moisture isn't causing the problem too. Make sure that it's weed free and that spores aren't collecting around the base. One of the things I'm going to show you this time of year is taking softwood cuttings. Softwood cuttings are great because all you're doing is taking a cutting of the plant that you want, doing a little bit of work on it, propagating it and stuff like that and then you get that plant next year for the cost of zilch really. So the first thing to do when you're taking softwood cuttings is look at the plant that you actually want to take a cutting off and make sure it is softwood. What is a giveaway to me usually is it's quite a fleshy soft stem of the new growth that you're looking for. Harder stems such as cornice and stuff we'll do later on in the year but today I'll be showing you cuttings on a bud layer. And the best thing to do with softwood cuttings is to take them early in the morning as the plant will have as much water and nutrients in it as possible. So first thing you'll do is take your stem at least 10 centimeters or a few nodules down and under the nodule that you want cut right through and take away. And remember to clip all your cuttings in a plastic resealable bag. This is for it not to dry out because if you don't use your cuttings today you can put your cuttings in the fridge to keep them moist. So when you're taking your cuttings, always try and take a non-flowering stem. This can be very difficult, but if you take a non-flowering stem, it's more easier to root further down the line. So this is a cutting of budley that we've taken. And it's just a quick description to let you know so you understand. The nodes are just where the plant itself splits. There's a few nodes on here, so I could actually take more than one cutting. But what you're wanting to do is take one, two, so your cutting will just be under this. Remove the leaves from that first node. 
And then you see, if I tilt it this way, you'll see there's a second node with that two leaves. That's fine. And then there's this third top part that's actually going to produce a flower. You remove that completely. And then I take the two leaves from the top node, cut them in half. And there you go. There's your cutting ready to take. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to propagate your cottons once they're ready. I like to use vermiculite, you get it to all garden centres, even pound shops nowadays. I like to use a 50-50 mix of vermiculite and compost, mixing well, so it's right through. And that's going to help you when you come to watering your cottons for the next wee while as you're waiting for it to root. Fill your compost up, dab a small hole in. And what I use for my cottons is a rooting gel. Dip your cotton well in the rooting gel, make sure that the node gets all of the rooting gel on it. Place it in the hole. Fill it in and make sure to water it. But this option, once you've watered it, is actually if you don't have a greenhouse. What you can do is make an artificial greenhouse very cost effective. You can actually use the bag that you took the cuttings in if you're finished with it, or a new bag at all. And just place the bag over the pot and it's actually going to create your own greenhouse. Always remember when doing this though, that three times a week for at least 10 to 15 minutes that you take the bag off and let the plant air itself. This time we're going to be using a propagator. So this is a propagator you get in all your garden centres, even in supermarkets nowadays. Why I would use a propagator is one, you don't have a greenhouse and you want to do it inside and obviously you've got a bit more space and you're taking a lot more cuttings than just the, the one I showed you with the plastic bag. What's great about propagators is that you know it's a bit more space to take up when you're, when you're doing it but you get a lot more chance to get the plant that you want. Once you've got all your cuttings ready Remember, it'll take about 10 weeks for them to root. Once they're well rooted, you can knock them onto bigger pots and look after them. So that'll be your cuttings in all three different forms. And if you do see a plant that you want to take cuttings of, always ask the owner's permission to take a cutting of it. I'm sure most gardeners out there would love you to have the same appreciation of the plant that they love too. You don't want to get yourself involved in guerrilla gardening. Thanks again for watching this month, and I hope we've all learned something about roses. And remember, gardening's all about growing, so let's grow together. 